If you're watching this video around the time of its release, then very soon or very recently, Charles Mountbatten Windsor will be formally crowned King Charles III. Or, to give him his full title, His Majesty Charles III, by the grace of God, of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and of his other realms and territories, King, Head of the Commonwealth, Defender of the Faith. As you can imagine, I am absolutely so very excited! Merry Christmas. God save the King. The official importance of this ceremony is often overstated. These days, the coronation itself is actually entirely symbolic. British monarchs accede to the throne automatically the moment that their predecessor dies, which means that Charles has been king in every sense that matters since the passing of his mother last summer. Nevertheless, that doesn't mean that the coronation is entirely meaningless. For Charles himself, it's probably a pretty nice day out. He gets to wear the crown jewels for the first time, including two separate crowns, an orb, and a scepter. He even gets to be anointed with a special sacred oil called chrism. For many Brits, it's an excuse to throw a party and get a little bit pissed in the daytime. But for the institution of the monarchy and its supporters, the most important function of the coronation is to serve as an opportunity to engage in a bit of myth-making. One aspect of this, in the days surrounding the ceremony, will be to stress the supposed continuity that the monarchy has provided over the years. So-called royal correspondents, such as the BBC's Nicholas Witchell, will be given hours of airtime to talk up the supposed stability, which is often attributed to Britain's system of constitutional monarchy. This myth is a popular one. Introducing his 2004 docu-series Monarchy, the right-wing historian David Starkey says of the British Crown that it's over 1,500 years old, which means that it's the oldest functioning political institution in Europe. Which is hardly the worst thing that David Starkey's ever said, but it isn't exactly true. As an international comparison, this appeal to a unique stability obscures the role that the British state and monarchy has played in regime change in, for example, India, or Asia, or Africa, or Australasia, or the Americas, or the Middle East, or at home, it erases the litany of coups and civil wars through which successive royal houses have been established and deposed. What it more intentionally ignores, however, is that whilst Charles might claim that his ancestors have ruled some aspect of Britain for more than a millennium, one of the most important episodes in the country's history was that in which it was, for a brief time, a republic. Or not quite. As the country prepares to crown a new king, I want to revisit this period in English history. All being well, this is going to be the first in a mini-series which I'm currently calling Treason Fest 2023. Across a handful of slightly shorter than usual videos, I want to counter these narratives which conflate British and, in particular, English identity with support for the monarchy. And I want to do so by highlighting the stories of various English folks over the years who have tried, with varying degrees of success, to consign the British crown to history. But I thought it would be nice to begin with a tale in which our protagonists were, at least partly, successful. So sit back and let me tell you the story of the English Revolution.
That's right, we're reclaiming talking portraits. It might seem odd to start a video about 17th century England by bringing up the concept of the fail son. The internet's favourite way of describing sons of wealthy parents who, despite their obvious incompetence, are nevertheless promoted to positions of great importance. Yet, while there's countless examples of hapless guys who fit that bill in our public eye today, few can hold a candle to the chief antagonist of today's video, Charles I. When he came to the throne in 1626, Charles I had it all. The kingdom he inherited was a largely peaceful one. Following the turmoil of the Protestant Revolution, the various factions within the Church of England had learned to, at least briefly, tolerate one another. And the chances of any other country trying to invade anytime soon were pretty low. Few would have predicted that, less than 15 years later, the country would be on the cusp of declaring a republic. In fact, Charles initially set out to strengthen the role of the monarchy. See, he had a strong belief in a theory known as the divine right of kings. Something he inherited from his father, James I. Charles's dad once stood up in Parliament and declared that Kings are not only God's lieutenants upon earth, but even by God himself, they are called gods. Although actually he was Scottish, so it probably sounded more like, Kings are not only God's lieutenants upon earth, but even by God himself, they are called gods. I think I nailed that. Which is a little conceited, but despite believing himself to literally be a god, James was also a pragmatist. He recognised that it was in his best interest to rule in collaboration with the representatives of the nobility and other wealthy landowners who sat in Parliament. Charles, on the other hand, wanted none of that. He felt that having to take into account the opinions of his subjects would be an insult to his God-given right to rule. Yeah, sorry guys, I would really love to compromise, but it's not the will of God that I don't, so what are you gonna do? Just four years into his reign then, Charles dissolved Parliament entirely, and for 11 years ruled completely on his own as a kind of kingly dictator. There was just one twist. Since the signing of Magna Carta in 1215, the king had needed the approval of Parliament to raise taxes. Given the tiny size of the state in this period, this wasn't so much of a problem in peacetime. It wasn't as though there was a welfare state, or fire service, or schools, or hospitals to pay for. The libertarian utopia of 17th century England, everybody. Careful not to catch the plague. Unfortunately for him, however, in 1640, an army of aggrieved Scots invaded England and swiftly occupied Newcastle in the northeast. Which might not seem like a great loss, but if he was going to stop them from advancing further southward, Charles was going to need to find some cash to raise an army. That year then, he ordered Parliament to return to London. And it's fair to say that its members weren't best pleased. After being ignored for 11 years, they weren't about to just gleefully rubber stamp Charles's spending plans. And so a group of Puritans, including this guy, John Pym, and this guy, John Hampton, thus began to organise their fellow members of Parliament to try and force Charles to change his ways. Now it's worth stressing that, at this point, not even the most radical members of Parliament had any intention of overthrowing the monarchy. England was a democracy only for the very rich. Which, uh, plus a change, as the French say. These were the wealthy representatives of wealthy men, who, more than anything, valued stability. All they wanted was a return to the collaboration between the King and Parliament, which had been the norm under James I. But Charles was what we'd call these days a bit of a prick. To be fair to him, when Parliament presented him with a list of grievances in the humbly titled Grand Remonstrance of 1641, it did accuse him of having a malignant and pernicious design of subverting the fundamental laws and principles of government which is mildly savage. But Charles's response wasn't just to reject Parliament's requests that he be less pernicious. Instead, he barged into the debating chamber accompanied by armed soldiers and attempted to have John Pym, John Hampton and three other MPs arrested for treason. In what will be a bit of a trend of blunders for Charles, 
This did more than even his most committed opponents ever could, to turn Parliament and much of the country against him. Concerned that he might repeat the episode, they passed a law which essentially confiscated his army and placed it under Parliament's control. In response, Charles began assembling a new army, and on the 22nd of August 1642, he raised his royal standard in Nottingham. In effect, he had just declared war on his own people. Now, it's at this point that some people did begin to contemplate more radical responses to the king's overreach. Many of the wealthy landowners in Parliament may have still been hoping simply to scare the king into compromise. But in taking up arms against the crown, they'd opened the door to a whole range of revolutionary ideas that had previously been unthinkable and many began to imagine an England without a monarchy at all. The hotbed for much of this radical thought was the army. Not long into the war, an MP turned general named Oliver Cromwell, who's going to be kind of important to this story, recognised that defeating the king's forces would require an army which didn't take to the field out of mere obligation, but out of a genuine belief in the cause for which they fought. Acknowledging that the king's army was a little bit fancier than his, he declared that he would rather have a plain russet-coated captain that knows what he fights for and loves what he knows than that which you call a gentleman and is nothing else. He was from Cambridge, so it probably did sound actually a bit like that. Cromwell thus persuaded Parliament to establish a new force, which would later come to be called the New Model Army. In this new army, political discussion and debate were encouraged. Soldiers reflected on questions of sovereignty, power and political legitimacy that a war against the king naturally raised. And this served the parliamentary cause well in battle. It fostered a commitment and discipline that was likely crucial to the king's eventual defeat. It was only after the dust had settled that the more moderate factions within parliament began to grow worried. After seven years of fighting, Charles I was finally beaten and captured. At which point, the moderate majority within Parliament once again set about trying to reach a settlement with him. These guys really did love a second chance, nor a third one, or a fourth one. But with more than 120,000 of their friends and family members lying dead, the newly politicised soldiers weren't about to bend the knee to a king who had so carelessly plunged the country into civil war. In the aftermath of the conflict then, there were broadly three factions, with very different views on what should happen next. The first were the moderates within Parliament, who were quite happy to let bygones be bygones and establish a new relationship with Charles. The second were the so-called army grandees. This group was made up of the senior officers in the New Model Army, such as Cromwell. The grandees were still largely wealthy, but had begun to accept that the stability that they sought might be more easily achieved by a political system which didn't rely on the whims of a hereditary monarch. More radical still than the grandees were a group known as the Levellers. As their name might suggest, the Levellers had developed a vision for a far more equal, or level England than had ever existed previously and would ever exist for hundreds of years to come. The levellers drew their support from the lower classes and from the rank and file troops within the army. And as such, their politics were pretty egalitarian. In 1647, they issued a draft of a new constitution called the Agreement of the People. This laid out a plan for a more liberal, democratic England. It called for freedom of religion, equality before the law, and the extension of the vote to most men over the age of 21. Outside of these core factions were more radical groups still. Perhaps the most notable of these were the Diggers. Under the leadership of a former tailor called Gerard Wynne Stanley, the Diggers were a group of proto-activists who established a series of collectivist communities in Surrey and Northamptonshire. They settled on disused wasteland, building houses and planting crops in a vibrant experiment in collective ownership and what would later come to be known as communism. Nevertheless, it was the moderates, the grandees and the levellers who were most able to push for their visions of the path forward. In the end, the moderates' hopes for reconciliation with the crown were largely dashed by Charles himself. 
As I've mentioned, he was a real piece of work. Obstinate to the last, he remained completely unwilling to engage in any kind of negotiations. And as a result, the grandees and levellers within the army decided to step in. In November 1648, the new model army demanded that negotiations cease and Charles instead be brought to trial for his role in provoking the civil war. But the moderate parliament rejected their demand. In response, two months later, a unit of soldiers led by Colonel Thomas Pride set up camp outside the parliamentary debating chamber. Those members who had voted to continue negotiating with Charles were either barred from entry or arrested. Others fled. With that, the moderates had been defeated and Charles's fate was all but sealed. In January 1649, the English people did something which had previously been unthinkable. They placed their own king on trial for treason. He stood accused of trying to uphold in himself an unlimited and tyrannical power, to rule according to his will, and to overthrow the rights and liberties of the people. Charles, of course, saw nothing wrong with this. He believed that to be his birthright. Seriously guys, God wants me to be an unlimited and tyrannical power. Throughout the proceedings, he thus completely refused to recognise the authority of the court, which, as ever, went really well for him. Unwilling to defend himself, Charles was found guilty, and on the 30th of January was executed by beheading in London. As I've mentioned though, the experience of the civil wars had been a deeply radicalising one for all involved. Charles may have been particularly annoying, but there was now a growing feeling that it was necessary to go further than getting rid of just this specific king. But before we go any further, I want to use the fact that we're talking about a medieval royal who struggled to live up to his father's expectations as an opportunity to recommend that you check out Abigail Thorne's The Prince, which is now available to stream on Nebula. The Prince is a stage play written by and starring Abigail, who many of you will know as the host of Philosophy Tube. The show had a hugely successful run in London last summer, during which it was filmed and has now been transformed by the team at Nebula into what is essentially a feature-length film. The Prince follows Sam, Jen and a bunch of other characters who have found themselves trapped in a multiverse made up of the plays of William Shakespeare. And as they work to free themselves from this strange theatrical universe, they're also forced to confront the roles that they play back in their real lives too. The gender expectations that have been placed upon them, their sexuality, their relationships with family members. It's a really funny but also deeply thought-provoking piece of work which I'm sure you will absolutely love. Of course, The Prince is just one of many, many brilliant original titles available on my streaming service Nebula, which is kindly sponsoring today's video. We're constantly adding more and more early access and exclusive content from your favourite creators. For example, I recently launched my new video podcast, Induction, in which I'm chatting to some brilliant guests about some fascinating topics. One of many perks of being a Nebula subscriber is that you get access to both the video and audio versions of every single episode of Induction a full two weeks before they're available anywhere else. Now, if you're interested in getting access to the absolute treasure trove of video goodness that is Nebula, then I'd be super grateful if you'd do so by using my personal link go.nebula.tv forward slash Tom Nicholas. Using that link will ensure you get access to the absolute best deal currently available on Nebula. The time of recording, that's just $2.50 a month. In return, using that link also sends a little bit of money my way, which helps me to cover the costs of making these videos, which hopefully you've seen I've been really, really pushing the production value of on lately, and would love to make even bigger and better in the future. If you sign up to and watch my videos on Nebula using that link, then you really will be supporting me and the stuff that I make in a way that means a huge, huge amount to me, both professionally and personally. That link again is go.nebula.tv forward slash Tom Nicholas. 
But if you'd like to watch the rest of this video first, then I guess I better get on with it. On the 19th of May, the remaining members of Parliament thus undertook a new first and passed legislation establishing the Commonwealth of England. This new country was to be explicitly Republican and was to be ruled, so the law read, for the good of the people and without any king or house of lords. This was a massive step. But beyond not having a king, there was still a great deal to be decided about how this new commonwealth should be run. Both the king and the moderates within parliament were now out of the picture, but there was still significant friction between the grandees and the levellers. The army grandees, represented by Cromwell, might have been persuaded to execute the king, which, you know, was a big deal, but they were still wealthy guys. They weren't about to submit to the levellers' demands that they give the vote to the lower classes. Worse still, for them, the levellers were gaining in both support and confidence. A couple of years previously, the levellers had even attempted a mutiny against the army top brass. In the month that Charles was executed, the levellers tried one last time to persuade Cromwell and his allies to sign up to their proposals for a fuller, more liberal English democracy. In response, Cromwell had their leaders arrested and shot. Their death signalled the end for any hope of a more radical, progressive English Republic. The defeat of both the radical levellers within the army and the moderate, well, moderates in Parliament might seem like an all-out victory for Cromwell and the grandees, but their track record of arrests and executions didn't exactly endear people to them. While they now controlled the organs of the state, their support base was increasingly narrow. The only way to maintain their position then was to rule with an iron fist. They did give Parliament a brief chance at running things, but it was a frustrating couple of years. Soon then, Cromwell took a little bit of inspiration from Charles I before him. He summoned a unit of soldiers and marched into the debating chamber. You have sat too long here for any good you have been doing, he told them. Depart, I say, and let us have done with you. That was pretty theatrical, I thought. I, I... Shortly after, Cromwell was sworn in under a new role as Lord Protector of England. The job was not that of king, and although it was later suggested that he adopt the title, Cromwell refused. Nevertheless, he did indulge himself by living in the former royal palaces and allowing people to refer to him as His Highness. Like Charles before him, he even suggested that his elevation to the role was the will of God. I wish I had just 2% of the self-belief of any of the characters in today's video. Cromwell wasn't quite a dictator, but the differences between Cromwell and the man he'd replaced looked increasingly small. Whether Oliver Cromwell was a popular leader in his time remains a pretty controversial debate. His conquest of Ireland was unrelentingly brutal, and he justifiably remains a hate figure in Ireland to this day. Like, there really is no way to cram in the horrors of Cromwell's conquest of Ireland in this video in any way that feels as substantial as it would need to be. But it was bad. Like, like really, really bad. To many in England, he was perhaps more respected. The diarist Samuel Pepys, who lived through this period, remembered him as a brave fellow who did owe his crown he got to himself as much as any man that ever got one. Although Pepys was a Londoner, so it was probably more like a brave fellow who did owe his crown he got to himself. <laughs> Either way, for those who did support him, it was very much a cult of personality. When he died in 1658, there was therefore fear that the chaos of the war years might return. Further, it wasn't like there was a huge difference between the role of Lord Protector and that of the King. Installing a new monarch then perhaps didn't seem all that much of a leap. It probably didn't help to dispel the idea that the Lord Protectorship was merely a monarchy by another name, that when Cromwell died, he nominated his son Richard as his successor. Richard was almost as incompetent as Charles had been, but he lacked the same conviction. Finally, someone in this story with just a little bit of self-doubt. 
After just nine months of disastrous rule, he resigned his post and legged it to France. The position of head of state of England was now vacant. News of this vacancy quickly reached Charles I's eldest surviving son, who, as a final measure of how conceited Charles I was, was also called Charles. There really is a lot of Charleses in this video. Charles's is. Charles Jr. had been living in exile in Europe for the duration of England's pseudo-republican experiment, and in spring 1660 he issued a document called the Declaration of Breda. In this declaration, Charles offered to take up the throne, and promised in return to forgive those who had fought against his dad during the civil wars. I give you clemency, you give me a crown. With England facing a very real power vacuum, Charles's offer was accepted, and later that month, he was declared king. Now, the court propagandists over at Horrible Histories would have you believe that Charles II was just a fun-loving guy who loved to party. Yeah, that's right, I'm starting beef with the children's educational TV programme Horrible Histories. But Charles could actually be pretty brutal. In fact, he quickly broke his promise not to punish those who had overthrown the monarchy. If you visit Westminster Abbey in London, you'll find a stone slab which reads, The Burial Place of Oliver Cromwell, 1658 to 1661. The reason for this weird three-year duration is that Charles II's first parliament, which was firmly royalist, swiftly ordered for Cromwell's body to be removed from its grave. He was then posthumously, quote-unquote, executed by beheading, despite the fact that he was obviously already pretty dead. His head was then placed on a spike outside Westminster Hall in London, where it remained for more than 20 years. After this, it was taken down and then bought and sold a whole bunch of times by a whole bunch of different collectors, to the point that Oliver Cromwell's head has such a weird and storied afterlife that it has its own Wikipedia page. I've never particularly aspired to having my own Wikipedia page, but um, I would quite like one just for my head. The remaining 40 men who had signed the warrant condemning Charles I to death were similarly hunted down and executed. Also, in much less brutal and much sillier news, a supporter of Charles II had this incredible statue made, which features Charles on horseback trampling over the body of Oliver Cromwell, which is just... Super subtle. I, I love this so much. In the long term, however, the establishment's main response to England's experiment with non-monarchical government has been to try their best to pretend it never happened. Or, if it did, that it wasn't all that important. The period between the death of Charles I and the crowning of Charles II is often referred to as the interregnum, between reigns. The implication is that it was all just a short interval, in which the plebs messed around for a bit whilst their rightful masters had a quick breather. But the reality is that both the English Revolution and the period of the Commonwealth of England were hugely consequential. For one, the beheading of Charles I smashed the concept of the divine right of kings. When Thomas Hobbes sat down to write his seminal defence of monarchy, Leviathan, in the years following the revolution, he could no longer simply argue, as James I had, that the king was chosen by God. Instead, much like defenders of the royal family in the present day, he had to make the case for the crown on purely practical terms. Further, the structural and social upheavals of this era shifted power away from the aristocracy and towards the emerging capitalist class. It thus played a key role in ending feudalism in England and laying the foundations for the emergence of capitalism. Perhaps the key reason that we're often encouraged to forget this period, however, lies in its political vibrancy. The explosion of radical ideas, which took place in the middle of the 17th century, completely quashes the dominant view of England as this fundamentally conservative country, allergic to even the slightest whiff of revolution. We see this not only in the successful revolution of Cromwell and the Grandees, but also in the far more progressive revolutions that he put down. The liberal, democratic revolution of the Levellers, and the outright communistic revolution of the diggers. 
There's a reason that when Brits are taught of the English Civil Wars, we're given only a sanitised glimpse at what took place and why. Because if we saw how our forebears were able to completely reimagine and remodel society in the past, we might wonder whether we could do the same in the present. I wouldn't blame you if you wanted to tune in as Charles is being crowned on May the 6th. Or even did tune in if you're watching in the future. I mean, I guess everyone's sort of watching this in the future, but like, like more in the future. However we feel about the continued existence of the British monarchy, there's an appeal to watching these historical events take place, to having this sense of somehow being there as important things unfold. Also, they used this song at coronations called Zadok the Priest, which is an absolute banger. I might tune in just to hear that, but I will shake my head in disapproval as I do. If you do watch the ceremony, however, I want you to look out for something. It will be easy to spot. At the climax of the whole ceremony, the Archbishop of Canterbury will place a crown on Charles's head. Shocker, I know. That particular crown is not the Imperial State Crown, which the monarch wears fairly regularly, but is instead St Edward's Crown. This crown is only used during coronations and is named after Edward the Confessor, who was the first to be crowned with this particular headpiece. Except the crown you'll see is not St Edward's Crown. It's a reconstruction. The original had all its gemstones removed and was melted down and sold by Oliver Cromwell, who described it as a symbol of the detestable rule of kings. The imitation commissioned by Charles II may attempt to recapture the sense of continuity that is often attributed to the British monarchy, but it is itself evidence that that claim of unbroken rule is a lie. Right there. While you're watching the most important moment in this festival of monarchical mythmaking, is a hidden reminder that the sense of continuity and stability the royal family so often tries to claim is a fabrication. Because for a brief moment in the 17th century, Britain didn't have a king or queen at all. And maybe that might serve as a reminder that one day England and Britain might complete that revolution and consign it to the history books for good. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you found it interesting in some way. Keep your eyes peeled next week for the following instalment of Treason Fest. I want to say a massive thank you, as ever, to the wonderful folks who support me over on Patreon. That includes Richard, Alan Gann, Gary, Dick on Spain, Bill Mitchell, ZC Reese, Alexander Blank, Neil de Bildgard, Sophia R, Nicholas Jacquemart, Strange Weekend, Ricardo Fernandez de Cordoba, Richard Rapoon, Amit Singh Paraha, Gabriel Koch, Demelza, Jimmy Dunn, Christopher Cowan, TK Loving, and Fiasco Linguini. If you'd like to join them in supporting what I do here, as well as getting access to copies of the scripts to each video, all director's commentaries, uh, and much, much more, then you can find out how to do so at patreon.com forward slash Tom Nicholas. Thank you again so, so much for watching, and have a fantastic week.